Yeah. Well, there's a difference between it's scope not creep really scope and just creep. like a successful product and iterating that on you it. want to add more features to. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a different thing. Welcome to the WAN show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that was a little awkward. <laughs> We've got a great show for you guys today. We have lots of good topics. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. See, I always want to see the worst in everyone. So I had taken the situation between Gamers Nexus and Newegg and kind of gone, okay, well, here's all the different ways it could have gone. Yeah, forget all of that. <laughs> Gamers Nexus posted a follow up video Ooh. yesterday. Basically it's proving rough. that this is 100% on Newegg. So we're going to talk about that. Also, Scum. Best Buy is at it again, putting GPUs behind paywalls. So yep. we'll be discussing that. What else have we got today? It keeps getting worse. There were some contaminated materials at Kioxia? Kioxia. 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 Uh, which is oh, going to no. cause the loss of 6.5 exabytes 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 worth of nand so flash prices are gonna go up that's the order it goes in you've got your petabytes and then you've got your exabytes <laughs> and when you lose 6.5 million exabytes it's sad yeah so that's gonna suck. Also, Rip Square potentially, if uh, if if stores actually end up using it. But Tap to Pay makes it so all iPhones can be used as mobile payment terminals. Whoops, that's gonna be a little that's awkward. A pretty big deal. Actually. Let's roll that intro. <laughs> Show is brought to you by ID Agents, MSI, and Mechanical Keyboards. I figure we better jump right into this new egg thing right off the hop here. Mm. Last week, Gamers Nexus revealed how bad Newegg's return system was with an open box motherboard that they bought that had a problem with it that Newegg blamed on them, even though Gamers Nexus said they hadn't even opened the box. Um, they just tried to return it, saying, look, we don't need it anymore. Newegg refused the refund, saying the board was damaged, and Gamers Nexus was at fault. Oh, boy. It gets worse. Yesterday, they posted a new video where they investigated the RMA chain. Apparently, Newegg RMA'd the board themselves to Gigabyte under Magnell Associates, Inc., a company they own, which was confirmed through corporate filings. I'm surprised they were able to get the, get the name that they filed the RMA under. That's like, that's some good detective work. Gigabyte said it would cost $100 to fix it, which is actually a pretty reasonable quote for a socket replacement. That's among the lowest I've heard, but I've been out of the game for a little while. Back when back when I was doing this stuff, it was more in the neighborhood of 150 to 200. And typically motherboards weren't even worth that much then. So I guess it's kind of a good thing that motherboards are way more expensive now. Because <laughs> it's worth it to repair them. Anyway, I'm assuming this is machine done now. It was probably hand done back then. Hard to say. There's been a lot of... You'd need yeah. machines either way, but... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Newegg apparently rejected the offer to fix it for $100, so then Gigabyte returned the board to Newegg. Oh. After this, Newegg sold the known defective board to Steve, meaning that he was out $500 despite never opening the box. Apparently they left the Magnell Associate sticker on the box, which is amazing. Genius. <laughs> Gamers Nexus unboxed the board, so they did get it back. Initially, my understanding is that Newegg had refused to send the damaged board back to them, but now they've got it, and the socket is in very rough shape. The thermal paste mentioned previously by customer support, though, is markedly absent. That was Hilarious. one of Newegg's claims, that there was thermal paste on the socket. Um, Steve says he's been getting calls from Newegg. Lol. <laughs> Um, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so, now what? At what point is... At what point do we look at this and go, this couldn't possibly have been an error. This had to be malice. Yeah, it's a scam. There's, there's got to be... I don't know what. There's got to be something in here that's illegal. Well, oh, there's almost certainly something in here that's illegal because ripping people off is illegal. Yeah. But whether or not so YouTube... selling a known defective product as, as 
Yeah, worked. whether or not that illegal thing that Newegg did was caused by an actual policy or whether it was caused by a careless, sloppy employee is a little bit harder to tell. And sometimes the line between those things can be blurry indeed. So let's walk through three possible scenarios here. Okay, scenario number one is that Newegg's internal policy is that they should take back merchandise that is known defective, box it back up and try to sell it as new, even though they know it doesn't work. Then when someone gets it and sends it back in for RMA, they say, ha ha, too bad. Now we've got the money and the product, we win. That's pretty, pretty unlikely. That's probably not if it. If you put that in on, on in writing, like you're in trouble. Um, I said, I said last week when we talked about this that if they had any kind of procedure like that that existed, there would almost certainly be a whistleblower that would have called them out on it. And we had people saying, there are whistleblowers. There's people who have bought things from Newegg and gotten ripped That's up. Not... That's not what a whistleblower is. Yeah, A whistleblower is someone who is on the inside, someone who's in the know, who exposes this type of policy or this type of practice. So I think we can say with a fair degree of certainty that that's probably not it. Okay. Let's go the other route. We've got someone who just out of absolute dunderheaded carelessness managed to take this board and like in a sleepwalking state, pack it back up into the box, carry it out to the shelf, get it scanned back into the system <laughs> under a change the status. Cause I'm sure they have like an internal RMA, like ticket system, kind of like we had at NCIX, get it transferred back to stock marked as brand new rather than as refurbished and then managed to sleepwalk themselves back to their station where presumably they woke up having had no awareness that they ever did any of this. So lunchtime. Yeah. yeah. I think that we can probably agree that that is equally unlikely. Yeah. Okay. So let me talk through what I think is the more likely third scenario. What I think is that Newegg's policy is by and large to do things pretty much correctly. And I think that by and large, most Newegg employees are awake at work. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I can't yeah. actually prove this. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. What can happen sometimes is that in spite of the policy being whatever it is, there can be pressure on employees or benefit structures or whatever that might incentivize them to cut corners in certain ways. Oh, yeah. Say, for example, as an RMA technician, I was incentivized to have a very low rate of discard, right? Because when something comes in, when something comes in for customer RMA, right, there's a number of different paths that it can follow through the system. So it could be uh, defective at no fault and it goes back to the manufacturer and you get a new one. It could be defective at fault and then it would go back to the customer and they get nothing or, or you just keep it and dispose of it and you keep their money, right? So those are two options. Newegg clearly has a favorite one here. Um, it could be <laughs> defective at fault and you do the repair, like what apparently happened with this particular board. Uh, but there's basically, there's different paths that it can follow. Now, there are cases where it might be that it's not the customer's fault and it's not the manufacturer's fault and you might have to just eat it. Like say, for example, it's it comes back and in testing, you uh, realize, oh, the board is working just fine. We could sell it as an open box and then you drop it on the floor. Now that's your problem and, and you need to eat it. So it could be- Just one quick thing. Someone, yeah. in, someone in chat said it was marked as open box. You should watch the content to report on it correctly. My, I, I never said it wasn't marked as open box. I said that internally in their system- the, During your sleepwalking thing, you said scanned in as new inbox. It, he knows- Yeah, but I'm talking about it, like I, a UPC. Yeah. Yeah, so it, because you got to remember, like, how do I say this? Not every person working in a warehouse, like picking and packing product is looking closely at what they're doing, right? So just because the box was clearly labeled <laughs> doesn't mean anything. If it was in a pile and the number matches the number, it is quite possible that regardless of what markings are on it, someone could just grab it and put it in a box and it could get shipped out. Um, anyway, so, sorry, uh, where was, where was I saying? What was I saying? Uh, 
you were talking. Right, right, right. Third possible outcome. Yeah. So you might have incentives to avoid certain final outcomes for RMA experiences. And that might lead you to do things that are unethical or outright illegal, that are destructive to the customer. Now, it's one of those things that's really frustrating for me because it gives Newegg a layer of sort of plausible deniability if they can, and we haven't seen yet how they are going to, how they're going to respond to this. To my knowledge, they haven't actually addressed it publicly yet. So I don't know what yarn they're going to spin, but it does give them a layer of plausible deniability if they can just pin it on an individual employee and say, oh, well, it's their fault. So we've seen this kind of thing before. And I'm not saying this is absolutely what happened. I'm just saying it seems like the most plausible one. And an instance of this would be the experiences that we've had dealing with Dell. That's what I'm reminded of. I think you could make the argument that Dell has done things as we've gone through our secret shopper experience with them that are unethical, illegal, and in some cases, both. Whether it is yeah. pushing financing on us or whether it's uh, adding extended warranties to our order that we never agreed to or whether it's um, arranging for us to ship our computer to their depot when we actually had an on-site warranty that we had paid for. Like there's plenty of things that they clearly did wrong. And my belief is that even though Dell has talked to me about these experiences and said, this is not the experience we want people to have. It is my belief that because of the way their representatives are incentivized, because of the way that they're compensated, there's basically no other way to survive. So they could say, well, our policy is to offer nicely, but clearly, clearly, if you're in the know, you get pushy about it, you get them commissions, and you manage to you know, eat a nice dinner every day that month instead yeah. of scraping by or yeah. whatever that difference ends up being. But I suspect it's a big one based on the consistency with which we've seen that behavior from Dell. So have you seen Paul's video? Uh, I haven't watched Paul's video, unfortunately. So apparently Paul was an RMA tech at Newegg. I know he worked at Newegg. I didn't know he, I didn't was, know he was an RMA tech. Me neither. Um, and apparently he posted a video on Dig Newegg Scam Gamers Nexus, a former RMA inspector's opinion. I have not watched it. It's probably excellent. That's what I would say. Uh, all right. Yeah. If anyone has kind of a somewhat TLDR at all, that would be amazing. Uh, would love to know Paul's perspective. And we're not just going to pull a... Uh, just watching someone else's content and reacting to it on stream thing right now, just yeah. this time. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll definitely go check out the whole thing when I have time. Uh, yeah, so, I didn't know this came out. I'll definitely watch it too, just not now. At this point, I mean, what do we do? Because it's pretty clear that This has either, happened to an abnormally large amount of people. That whether it's through policy or whether it's through lack of resources or or yeah yeah it's it's almost it's almost impossible to paint a picture where new aid comes out looking like anything but shady here yeah so now what do we do we've got amazon great we got new egg great where do you buy your computer hardware I mean, Micro Center technically does have an online presence, and they've been pretty good from what we've seen so far. We've worked with them a lot, and typically, especially when someone shows up in a sponsor spot with us, we will get people crawling out of the woodwork to tell us about their bad experiences yeah. with them. And by and large, everything that has come out about Micro Center has been very positive. If I was American, my reaction to this would probably be to go to Micro Center. As a Canadian, my reaction to this would be like, I don't know, Canada Computers Memory Express, something like that. Yeah, but that's, you're in Canada. Yeah. So that doesn't help our American friends. Yeah, it's at Micro Center. Oh, though. sorry. I haven't personally heard notable bad things about Micro Center. I, I have heard people say that they're like, and someone literally just said this in Floatplane Chat, but I have heard this elsewhere as well, where they're like upset when they move away from a Micro Center, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. But like, I don't know. B&H also has some things. Yeah, B and H though for component selection, it's not amazing. Uh, hey, you're live on the WAN show. Is that chill? 
Sure, my this daughter's is Paul. in the car too, though. Hey, Hannah, Hannah, say hi. Okay, she's shy. Yeah, it was worth a shot. I, I know how it goes. Can you guys hear Paul all right? Okay, hopefully the chat's going to let us know. All right, so Paul, um, I actually did not know about your video before we came on stream and we wanted to talk about the Gamers Nexus thing. And I figured, hey, if uh, since I've got you on speed dial anyway, can you can you tell us a little bit about your experiences as an RMA tech? We already told people to go watch your video for the whole story, but I, I needed TLDR and I didn't know where else to turn. Sure, yeah, and thank you. Um... I mean, it was my job for about a year. It was within the first year that I joined Newegg. It was part of customer service, but I worked out in the RMA warehouse, which was attached to the same built. It was all in the same warehouse facility. Interesting. Um, so at right? Newegg, yeah. sorry, at Newegg, the structure then is that RMA technicians also reply directly to customer tickets? I can't speak to how they do it now, and I think it might be different now than it was then. Like, the point of my job at the time was to have someone who, who could talk to the customer and communicate and, and be like, oh, okay, take special circumstances into account. Um, but, you know, I was also a, a customer service agent, not a warehouse worker. Uh, CS agents, I think, get paid more. So I'm not sure if at some point they decided that they should separate that, and now there's a different team who looks at, you know, special RMAs in the warehouse versus the CS agents were actually in direct contact with the customer. Um, but at the time, like, I had that ability. So I was there physically holding your return and also emailing back and forth with you. So it was a pretty, you know, there wasn't, a, there, there wasn't any communication gap there. Got it. Okay. And so from your experience working at Newegg, what are the odds that they could have accidentally sold this motherboard again, knowing that it was damaged? Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's another good question. And also, I, it could also be something that is two separate departments at this point. Um, it could, there could be returns that go to one facility, and then there could be another facility that has actual, like, open box products or other stuff like that, um, that they, hey, I'm, I'm live on the wind show. <laughs> Hi. My wife's so bad, too. Let me switch to my phone since I just got home. <laughs> okay, can you still hear me? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, yeah. What was, I, what was I talking about? Um, it's entirely possible that wherever that open box, like whatever route that product took, as far as Newegg getting it, returning it back to Gigabyte, Gigabyte being like, no, we can't accept this or you have to pay for it. And then I don't know how it got back to Newegg and then how it got back into Newegg's inventory. That's, that's the big mystery. And right. whether that was intentional or not, you know, that, I mean, that's obviously the question mark. Is there someone there who's like, oh, I'm going to take this product that was otherwise a loss and try to make something of it? I mean, yeah. But, the, oh, and he's dead. Let's see if he comes back. <laughs> So one interesting thing, and this was brought up on last one show, I believe, yeah. is that Liaison Interactive purchased out Newegg in 2016. Yes, 2016. So Paul would have worked for them before that. Hi, you're back. I'm back. So so yeah, so the so you kind of pitched the uh, maybe an enter an enterprising employee who was trying to, you know make some extra money for the company by selling a defective motherboard to someone or whatever could have conceivably done this. And you know what? That might have been one of my possible hypotheses as well, because I remember back at NCIX, the eBay department, um, and this was honestly what I felt probably happened with that, uh, that fiasco where MSI was caught scalping GPUs, supposedly. Um, and yeah. my understanding is this ultimately was what happened, is that the eBay department is not necessarily involved in every strategic business meeting and will sometimes just go and do very random rogue stuff. So I can tell you from my experience at NCIX, once something made its way into eBay land, the odds of something sketchy happening um, went up exponentially. Like they were much higher. But the problem for me is that this is a product that was just not bought on eBay. Like it was just bought on Newegg.com. 
Yeah, that combined with, you know, how they're labeling the open box stuff a lot less obviously now, um, that, that, that's a concern because it isn't, a, it, 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 it's not the kind of product that should have been sold as a new product. Like that should be completely separate inventory. But once you get into the stuff that has already been handled or returned or, you know, damaged in shipping or something like that, all of that, I, and I will say that when I worked in the RMA warehouse, stuff piled up. Like there was stuff that arrived that even I was like, well, it's not, you know, I'm not responsible for it or whatever. Things would just get shoved off into the corner because there was nothing else to do with it. And eventually you might have someone come along who's like, let's try to make more profit out of, out of this stuff, regardless of its condition. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think if you want to give New the New benefit of the, of the doubt and assume that there is maybe a problem here that could be fixed, if there is someone at the company who is making shady decisions and deciding to take products like that and try to resell them and be like, aha, the customer is just going to get screwed over, but we'll make some money. Like if that person gets rooted out, then cool. Right. If it's, you know, if, if there's someone who has oversight over this, who is also aware of it and it's, you know, a bigger problem than that, then obviously that's a bigger problem. And, um, people should hold them accountable for how they're treating customers. The most unbelievable one to me, because I don't even I don't even actually necessarily mind that the label's not super obvious. I mean, going back to NCIX, our systems weren't particularly advanced, but I can tell you that our internal label would say refurbished on it if it was anything mm -hmm. other than brand new. And it wasn't super obvious, but what would happen is we tracked it electronically. That's why I was saying earlier in the show, I said, well, hey, someone would have had to manually move this thing out of the RMA pool into not an open box and not a refurbished pool, but into a brand new inventory pool because, and I'm assuming Newegg has to have at least this level of sophistication. There was absolutely no way that on a customer invoice, because the way it worked is you'd get the bin. The bin would roll down the conveyor, and then we had the scanning station that would verify the contents of the bin against the physical invoice at the time of uh, before it would go on to the next conveyor where it would be boxed and shipped. And so the way that process worked was every single item in the bin would be scanned against the physical invoice, and then we would check electronically in the system to make sure that the electronic version of the invoice matched the physical one and that that matched the contents of the bin. And there was no way to scan an open box item onto a brand new purchase because they were separate inventory pools. And there is just no conceivable way for me that even if you could miss the label, right? You can miss a label, okay? You can miss a piece of text or a piece of tape or even a big piece of paper taped onto something. You can miss that conceivably if you were sleepwalking. But there's no the, way... The, the sticker on the motherboard was massive on Steve. Yeah, but, was... but there's no way that it you can open. miss... <laughs> There's no way you can miss a miss scan where it says, hey, this order is not complete. Like we had a sound that played. Like it wouldn't let you do it. It can't be that bad. And that should be to, to prevent the wrong item getting put in the box and shipped to the customer. So I, I guess you're, you're questioning whether he even got the proper item that was supposed to be sent to him or if just somehow oopsie in the warehouse they tossed in this random crappy open box motherboard with bent pins versus the one that they were actually supposed to ship. So the chat's clarifying that it was marked open box. So that's fine. But either yeah. way, guys, inventory pools at an organization like an NCIX or like a Newegg are going to be tracked separately. Your RMA pool of inventory, like when you're, okay, when you're a product manager, because that's what I did. When you're a product manager going through your inventory report for uh, gigabyte motherboards, right? I don't see inventory on that report that is in our RMA pool. How would that be useful to me in my job, right? I see open box and I see brand new in box, but I don't see RMA. When you move something from one place to another, a decision has to be made to do that. And there's no way that you could scan something on a brand new invoice that is open box. And there should be no way that you can scan something from an RMA pool that is supposed to be open box. Do you kind of get what I mean? So how the heck could this possibly happen? And and that's maybe why it deserves a, like a lot more scrutiny because I would be curious to know what agreements are in place between like manufacturers such as like an MSI or Gigabyte and a retailer like doing when it comes to 
the resale of like products that have been returned or that are open box or something like that. And like, here's the other thing. It's a, it's what a Z. It was a Z five ninety motherboard, right? Or it was. It's not a new motherboard. No. Like, how many open box versions of how many open box of that motherboard do they have? I would bet it's a very, very small amount. Yeah, I'd wager it's not very many. But somebody had to have, you know, created maybe a branch SKU or something like that for open box versions of the same product and then listed it for sale. So that's that's why, to me, it doesn't seem like the wrong product was tossed in the box. It seemed like they intentionally listed this motherboard specifically for sale on the website. And obviously they shouldn't have, but how did it get there and who... you know, whose who's job is it currently to take products like this and list them for sale? And I, are they being very, very, very horrible at their job, uh, you know, and, and or potentially even, you know, going over that line to the point where they're you know, scamming customers? I got to tell you, I have a big problem with open box motherboards in the first place because the motherboard, I'd say right up there okay. with memory is the component is probably the the most likely component to have some kind of problem with it that isn't obvious immediately. If you kind of get what I mean? Yeah. And so like a, like a, a nick not working or something like that. Exactly. Or like yeah. an instability issue that only pops up once every 6 hours or something mm-hmm. like that. Like it's far more likely to encounter something like that on a motherboard or on a stick of memory compared to a CPU, for example, yeah. or a case, obviously. Like it's just, it's what, or a GPU. GPUs are typically broken or they're not broken. And it's yeah. relatively obvious. You know what I mean? And so even just the practice of selling a motherboard that has already been returned should be should be approached so cautiously and so carefully that never mind if it has a mangled socket, right? You should be double checking and triple checking that there was actually nothing wrong with this board, that it was only returned because they exchanged it for a different one with better onboard graphics or a different color scheme or whatever the case may be, and that you know for a fact that it's working. <sighs> so to play devil's advocates, as, as I know you like to do sometimes and come at it from the manufacturer's perspective, because you know how slim the margins are in, in this industry. I do. Should, should all motherboards cost a few more dollars well, to, to absorb the impact of having to eat the cost of returns and not sell them as open box or, or you know, handle it in that sort of way. It's funny you mentioned that. We actually talked about the race to zero. I mean, I'm sure you've heard the term a thousand times being in this industry. 2% more. Mm-hmm. And we talked about this on the WAN show last week where we, uh, Luke and I talked about how we should turn LTTstore.com into an electronics retailer and that'll be our model. We'll just mark everything up. Like literally two, two and a half percent more would probably be all that you would need to have industry leading customer service compared to everybody else. Because those that is how slim it was. Do you remember when Newegg tried to go IPO? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I remember that. Yeah. I was supposed to have some, some stock options that never really, uh, <laughs> never really amounted up to anything. Well, they would have been pretty poopy uh, stock stocks because uh, I, I don't know if you did you look at the financials. New eggs or what? Back yeah, when they were trying. Yeah, new eggs. Uh, it's it's a long time ago. The net profit was somewhere in the neighborhood of like one percent, and oh, yeah. on on like I think it was on like about a billion dollars annually in sales. Like it was a freaking lot of money in sales. And so 1% of a billion dollars is still a freaking lot of money, right? It's all that volume. It's all about that volume, right? (laughs) But nobody is going to invest in a company that is making 1% net profit. So I think that's something a lot of viewers don't really understand when I do tend to come at things from a manufacturer's or from a, uh, a retailer's perspective is that there's no free lunch. If you want cheap as chips electronics, it comes from somewhere. Yeah. Now, that's yeah, not I... an excuse. You still have to abide by the law. And it appears as though Newegg, whether intentionally or unintentionally, clearly did not do that here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's... You're putting it in 
pretty stark terms there. And yeah, I mean, it's are, are we ever going to find out for sure whether it was intentional or unintentional? Is there ever going to be any sort of like direct addressing of this by Newegg on some level? Not unless there's a whistleblower. Uh, so if anyone from Newegg is watching, I implore you now, blow the whistle, get in touch with us. We want to see the internal tickets that have been sent around about this case because I guarantee you they've made it to the VP level at this point. Yeah. I want to hear from you. What happened? Someone blow the whistle. I'm ready. Or better yet, reach out to Steve from Gamers Nexus because he's the one who should be breaking this story. All right. All right. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thanks for calling. And uh, have, a, have a great rest of the way show. And what's up, Luke? That's Luke, right? Hi, what's Paul. Luke, better believe Hi, it. Luke. Man, it's been Hope so long. Been. Yeah, we'll have to. Are you going to Computex this year? I'm, I'm currently, that is like my intent. Yeah. Okay, I would. I want to go. So, uh, if Me there's too. Computex, man, we gotta have like a reunion dinner or something. I haven't seen you in forever. Yeah. That would be awesome. All right. All right. Later, dude. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay, bye. So there you have it, um, Paul, with the very unusual for him balanced take. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> Obviously, Paul's always a very b balanced and level person. He really is. Um, New egg stock over the last year has gone woof. By well, the way, um, yeah, it's I mean, been, it's it's terrible, been terrible. If I was an investor, it's the last bit. I mean, I've had every opportunity, guys. I have had every opportunity. Do you know how easy it is to sign up for a distributor account with like Bell Micro or Ingram or whatever, uh, and start just like drop shipping, s selling electronics. Do you guys have any idea how easy that is? We could probably be set up in a matter of hours. <laughs> There's a reason that I got better stuff to do. Like selling these wonderful Thread Ripper editions. <laughs> if you want to have a good customer service experience. <laughs> we do have good customer service. No, I was being serious. Because we shamelessly charge enough for our products that we can afford to have. Okay, it's a little slow right now. We are hiring more people, but it's good. We will get you taken yeah. care of. Uh, but yeah, we charge enough that we can actually afford to provide, you know, proper solutions when people have a problem. And so we've got a number of new products. We announced the ABC book character plushes last week. And this week we've got the Couch Ripper. It's available in three different sizes. So uh, Luke's got the big one. It's huge. It's <coughs> massive. He's got, he's got that big one. <laughs> and uh, I'm holding the medium one. And this is the ADB small one so you guys can check them out they are significantly more expensive than the intel version but let's let's you know they're better what do you want me to say no 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 it's because they're bigger <laughs> it's just because they're thread ripper shaped and sized so they just are stuffed with a lot more a lot more stuff but it starts at just 19.99 for the cute little uh couch ripper one that you can just you know put on a shelf or whatever as a little decorative piece all right so new egg there's no way for them to come out of this looking good I don't think we'll ever get a clear answer as to what exactly happened, no, which not. leaves us finally back to the question I asked probably like 20 minutes ago at this point. What do we do? I, Is this boycott worthy? I would personally. You would just not shop there anymore. Yeah. You're done. At, at least for a period of time. Send a message. Yeah. Okay. We've, we've said for the entirety of the length of the WAN show has been live to vote with your wallet, right? Absolutely. Even if it's a temporary thing, you can do that. You send so a message. If, if I was a consistent New Egg customer, I would pause my New Egg customerness for a, at least a temporary period of time. If what do you think is fair? What do they deserve? A quarter? I'd, six I'd, months? I'd, a year? I'd do at least six months. You'd say six months. Yeah, but that's that's on like a personal level, right? So I'm I was like, feeling like six months was a pretty good length yeah. of time as well. What is my level of impact here? I mean, I can tell you right now, we've paused working with New Egg. Um, from a sponsor standpoint, like as a Canadian, um, Newegg isn't my go-to for buying electronics anyway. They do have a store up here, but they're not necessarily as competitive with, you know, Canadian first retail outlets. So I would just go to Memex or I'd go to Canada Computers or whatever. I've been going to Memex. I like that they have a very local place. I like picking up my stuff. I don't really know why. Mm -hmm. I've just always, it was always a, a ritual for me to go pick up my stuff from NCX. And now I do that still from from Memex. So. Yeah, for sure. So so for me, I, I I don't really have a way of I don't really have a way of pushing back on Newegg from a customer standpoint, but from a and this is sort of ironic, um, from a sponsorship standpoint, which is actually me 
them being the customer, uh, they they like they pay me for sponsorships. I could stop taking their money, and because presumably when they pay me money, there's a greater it's return worth it for, them. for them. Yeah. So so it's sort of like, it's very ass backwards. But <laughs> I think you guys get the point. So I'm with you. Let's say six months of not working with Newegg, at which time we're going to reevaluate it. And this is a great opportunity for me to show you guys that we've actually started a new initiative here uh, to give you guys an opportunity to weigh in, not just on Newegg when we revisit this in six months, but also our other sponsors. There's actually a whole new section of the forum here called LMG Sponsor Discussion, where we are going to be uh, posting new sponsorship opportunities that come up, obviously. We're going to do our own due diligence on sponsors. Um, that's something that we have been working consistently to improve over the last few years as we've grown our business team. But we want to hear from you guys because a lot of the time our experience won't necessarily mirror the same uh, or the experiences that consumers might have had. And it also doesn't allow us to look back in time. We might go and order something from some new sponsor and we might have a fantastic experience. They might have our address flagged. You never know. I, that, I wouldn't put it past. That, that's not even that sophisticated these We've days. We literally said if we were working at these companies, we would do it. Absolutely. Like, yeah. They might have our address flagged. They might have recently cleaned up their act. Um, and maybe they were really shady six months ago. And there would be no way for us to know that other than hearing from the community. So we want you guys to start really being an active participant in the brands that we should be working with that you feel are are complementary to, to our brand. So that's where we... That's where we're at on that. We want we want to hear from you guys. But Newegg, I think we've heard the message loud and clear. Um, six month pause on working with Newegg, so we'll revisit it sometime in August, I guess. Yeah, yeah. All right, that means they're going to miss out on the back to school, the back to school period. Should we jump on a few curated messages? Yeah, let's do that. Just see if there's any like specifically about that or anything else. That's absolutely. Oh shoot, I don't have it open. What happened to my tab? Oh balls. Uh, well, you're on it then. Okay. Uh, Never mind. I have it. It has a new um, favicon. So I got confused. Oh, yeah. I don't know why it's a bike, but it's Okay. Good. It's a bike. <laughs> uh, Linus bike. Yeah. That's a thing. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. And it's orange, so, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, hold on. Empty Hammer says, I legit can't think of a company that was shady and no longer is. Um, there are companies that have rehabbed their images in significant ways. Here's one, Lucky Gold Star. Really? Lucky Gold Star was known for being absolute garbage back in like the 80s, early 90s. And nowadays you know them as... Uh, I, uh, I don't remember actually. Lucky Gold Star. Lucky G Gold Star. LG? Yeah. It's just LG. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I for me personally, Zotac. Okay. I I yeah. my understanding. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, because when when I was first getting into computer stuff, it was like, I don't know. I didn't know them as like bad for customer service or anything, but generally I knew them as like generally lower quality products cheaper stuff yep. uh, and whatnot and then as the years have gone on quality's gone up um they're they're like attention to detail on different things like they they seem very legit now. they've really innovated they've done yeah. some really cool like ultra compact cards and yeah. stuff like that over the years yeah they drove a lot of those ultra compact cards they did. for a while there so like yeah they, i've seen them on the come up quite a bit uh people are like LMAO, I literally thought LG stood for life's good well it does now but it yeah. stood for lucky gold star back then a lot of uh, a lot of particularly Asian companies started out with um, sort of more uh, uh, names that were more culturally appropriate over there and then rebranded to more Western sounding names to Would you count improve MSI their appeal. under that? Yeah, MicroStar International. Yeah. Uh, DFI, remember DFI motherboards? Diamond Flower International. Like that's just a thing. That's like a very Taiwanese way of branding. I mean, Asus was Pegasus. Yeah. That's where the Asus, Pegasus, Pegasus. And so they, when they split uh, into Pegatron, which is their manufacturing arm, and Asus, which is their consumer electronics arm, Pega 
and Jesus. Yeah, that's cute. It's all right. Yeah. Uh, one of the merch messages from Maria M is, "Hey Luke, any oh, advice on Hyundai Kia?" That's another one. I didn't know that. Hyundai and Kia. No, no, no. Just like that they sucked and now they're great. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, oh man, Kia. Whoa. Yeah, weren't they just like super trash? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know as much about Kia. Now you like, you look at a Kia like, damn. That's sweet. <laughs> look at that Kia. <laughs> uh, Maria M. Merch Message says, hey Luke, any advice for a first custom keyboard build? Um, do lots of research and I, I think one of the biggest like, gap makers in custom keyboards is whether you actually use lube or not um, mm -hmm. you should really do it a lot of people don't and it's a big detractor in the overall feel of your of your board you so. should use lube luke 2022 yeah it's a good idea just makes you know just it all works a little bit better a little bit smoother um it feels better david says i'm a pleasurable experience i'm struggling to balance <laughs> working toward my dream career and family troubles at home during your career grind, has there ever been a time when you felt overwhelmed? <laughs> okay, so at risk of TMI here, uh, my wife and I have a dual head shower, and we often shower together. And we've actually found that when we're in the shower together is one of the few times that we can like really talk because you're not doing anything else when yeah. you're in the shower, right? Like... There's no well, kids bothering. Well, okay, we're married, so <laughs> clearly, clearly that doesn't happen anymore. No, so you, when you're in the shower, your 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 attention is focused entirely on each other, other than you know some absent-minded soap in the pits, if you know what I'm saying. So um, we've had a lot of like big talks in the shower. Yeah. And one of the times that really stands out to me is a time that we were having like quite an emotional talk and like she was well, well, quite, quite emotional and talking about how I keep saying we got to reach this next milestone. And then we reach the milestone, whether it's moving into the Langley house that we used as an office or paying off the Langley house or getting moved into the office, or paying off the office, or hiring this next set of writers. After we get this, this round of writer hires, it'll be fine and I'll have more time. And she's like, you keep pushing, you keep kicking this can down the road. You keep saying, okay, when we have kids, I'll be family first. When the kid's old enough to remember anything, I'll be family first. When this, family first. Well, when is it going to happen? Um, and you know when when am I going to be when am I going to be first? When are you going to focus on doing stuff with with me with us? And what what we both ultimately came around to, what we realized, is that even though our life is consumed by work and by taking care of kids and by you know things that um, you know I think a lot of people would consider to be chores, right? And even though we didn't, we never took a break. Like we went straight from dating to marriage. We took a two week honeymoon. That was, that was it. And then we got, we buckled right down into it. I mean, we got, we got married in April and we had our first baby in April. All right. And it was not shotgun wedding, not the same April, the following April, okay. but, but we basically got back from our honeymoon and got down to it. Right. So we never really like took a break. And, um, you know, I think that's been really hard um, I think that's been really hard on both of us and especially Yvonne and what we ultimately came around to and what I think has given us both a lot more peace is that we have to see those choices that we made as things that we do together. Yeah. We, it can't be like, oh, all we did, all we talked about this week was work and parenting. It has to be work and parenting is what we do for better or for worse. Those are the life choices we've made. Those are our hobbies. Those are, you know, maybe we don't build model ships in bottles together. Maybe what we do is we parent three amazing children together. Yeah. That's what we do. That's what we do together. And so ever since we reframed work and we reframed childcare in that manner, it's been far less of an issue for us. I mean, obviously you have to set aside couple time. You have to. Yeah. 
Uh, you have to spend one-on-one -on -one time together doing nothing but just looking at each other and talking to each other because otherwise you will not make it. Um, you could, there, well, I guess I, I told myself I wasn't going to have any hot takes today, but I guess that's one. And I, uh, man, I forget where I was really going with this, but the point is, where did, where did this even go? Did you ever feel like there was time when you felt overwhelmed? Yeah, absolutely. How'd you stay positive and focused? I mean, working on things together was a big part of it. And, and that was, that was a big part of that conversation too, is that, um, yeah, we're, we're doing this thing and, and, you know, okay, it's called Linus Media Group and that's not always easy for you because you're, you're in the background a lot of the time. Uh, but you got to understand, like, I can't do it without you. And I know a lot of people don't appreciate properly what you do, but a lot of them do. The ones that were there from the beginning know what you do and I know what you do. But I mean, that's still like got to be hard for her, right? Because it's well, like, I think it still is Linus too. Media Group, Linus yeah. Tech Tips. Uh, she almost never gets that that FaceTime. Um, and a lot of the time, and this is really frustrating, even internally, she's working on things that are not um, not for not for employee consumption. Like, you know, she'll be working on something like back, okay, back when we were uh, at the Langley House. She was the one who did everything, oh, yeah. getting this place arranged and set up and like a huge spectrum whoa my headphones just popped in and out um a huge spectrum of work too because not only did she do a the leg work on acquiring the place which is extremely difficult on its own um but also going every like setting the whole place up all the way through like architectural design to actual yeah. just like room design very hands-on extremely yeah. hands-on yeah so Spend time together. Um, as for as for staying positive, I mean, setting small goals. Um, try not to trying to make them realistic. You know, when I would set small goals, I'd be like, okay, let's get to this milestone. But then you just like keep going. You keep going a hundred percent, no matter what. Um, take breaks. I mean, these are all things that are you're going to find in any sort of general life advice yeah. book or article. But they're they're true. Don't ignore them. I guess would be would be my summary. I think the the thing that I've been most concerned about your guys' side from is the vacations. And I can't speak very well for this because I burn most of my vacation time. Anyways. Yeah, you're but, stupid. Yeah. Um, He's like, honestly, like I, I say that in the most uh, <laughs> affectionate possible way, but you're an idiot. Yeah, he has I, vacation uh, time. I tell him, go away. <laughs> Stop working. Goodbye. And then he's like replying to emails and stuff. And I'm like, goodbye. Yeah. And he just does because we only we only allow vacation time to accrue for so long because we can't have people just like taking six months off all of a sudden uh, in a row. Like, like, you know, I think we let you carry it over for one extra year. I don't, even know. I don't, I don't remember counting. the policy yeah. anymore. But the point Whatever is that is taking right. vacation time is healthy. Yes. And so I... our policy is that you have to use it because you are supposed to use it. I did before COVID lockdowns. Mm. I did. Sort of. Yeah, sort of, yeah. I wanna go travel. The only thing I really like to take vacation time to do is go travel, so it's hard to do that when that's yeah, been tough. mostly shut down. But a lot of your vacation time that you've taken, um, and again, I'm, I'm not the right person to criticize on this, but a lot of the vacation time that you've taken has had to be things that are akin to work it's not been particularly restful I'll exactly say that much. yeah 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 so i've always kind of been concerned about that because everybody needs that battery recharge time right yeah i mean for me honestly speaking there's there's different things that recharge me more sure like i'd say i got more recharged from that intel trip checking out the fabs than I would have from a vacation dude i totally see that actually i uh i i really miss like work trips like i worked the, the brandon and luke phone off. trips were were huge battery rechargers for me yep. even though it was like gas 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 100 percent of the time yeah it was yeah it's it's a change of pace like i was freaking going oh yeah but but it feels good it's like a yeah but yeah, yeah i was on my way out of there one night and one of the intel employees asked me oh are you gonna do any sightseeing while you're here and i was like no, dude. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I already saw the coolest thing. That's what we were doing all day. In this yeah. whole country. Yeah. Wait, what did you think I was here for? Yeah. I don't have to do this anymore. Yeah. I don't travel anymore. Like, that's something I actually haven't really talked about that publicly, but I think viewers have probably noticed that 
I don't go anywhere anymore. I went down to I went down to Seattle for Valve because that was like an hour and a half drive, and it was the freaking Steam Deck. Yeah. Okay. Going to Valve is kind of a so. In the thing. last two years, I have gone to Valve, and I have gone to the Intel Fab. That is it. I'm out, and I'll do Computex because I love Computex. I love Taipei. I love getting together with all the other tech nerds. So my, they're is, my people. For some reason, especially good at that. Yeah, it's the, great. The meetups, yeah. I just want to go walk around with Wendell again. I know, right? I hope he goes. That'd be great. I believe I, I, we were literally talking about it like not that long ago. I, yeah, I hope he goes too. I'm super he goes, down. I'm, I'm going. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> uh, am I paying for it? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Okay, anyway, <laughs> I forget what we were talking about there. Hey, he's on float plane. Yeah, okay, yeah, so you got to meet with Wendell and you yep. have to do it in Taipei. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. Yep. Uh, why don't we go ahead and actually we should get through our sponsor spots real quick here because yeah. we talked about like nothing. Uh, the show is brought to you by ID Agent. Thank you for sponsoring the show. Do you know that 90% of data breaches start with a phishing email? I didn't know that, but I believe it. Yep. Um, so... With ID Agent, you can reduce your organization's chance of experiencing a cybersecurity disaster by up to 70% through security awareness training. Bullfish ID by ID Agent is a phishing simulation platform that transforms your biggest attack surface into your biggest defensive asset. You can add every employee to your security team by effectively running uh, training campaigns with reporting so that you get stress-free, consistent training that gets real results. So you've got this, uh, these plug-and-play phishing campaign kits, that, and they've got video lessons, so you, or you can create your own phishing campaigns, and effectively, you're providing practical training, sort of unexpectedly, like pop quiz style, and making sure that people are staying up on whatever the latest phishing scams are. It's a super cool way to approach it. So it's effective, affordable, one-stop phishing resistance training that fits any business and budget, and you can get two months free and 50% off setup at bullfishid at it.idagent.com slash when. Right there. it.idagent.com slash, oh, Linus, apparently it says down there. Well, whatever. Linus or Wan or something like that. I'm sure we'll get credit for it. Yep. Either way, the show is also brought to you today by MSI. MSI's clutch GM41 wireless lightweight gaming mouse is a great choice for FPS gamers. It's got a symmetrical right-handed design and it weighs only 74 grams. That's insane. <laughs> it uses That's a Pixar PA PAW. PAW, PWA, PAW, PAW 3370 sensor with up to 20,000 DPI sensitivity and 400 inch per second tracking. And thanks to its latest 2.4 gig RF wireless transmitter, latency is just one millisecond. It uses Omron switches rated for over 60 million clicks. Plus you get up to nine hours of battery life with just 10 minutes of recharge time and up to 80 hours on a full charge. You can check out the Clutch GM41 and buy your own at the link down below. Finally, the show is brought to you by MK Keyboards. Thanks mechanicalkeyboards.com. They have tons of mechanical keyboards, switches, keycaps, and much more for sale. And featured brands include Tai Hao, Ducky, Vermillo, Miko, and more. They also have learning resources. If you're looking to learn more about switches, boards, and what layout is right for you, and they offer free shipping in the United States of A. You can check them out and use code LTT at the link in the video description today. All right. What's our next big topic today? Oh, I'm just looking at these merch messages, but we do have a few things. There's the Best Buy thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Best Buy's at it again. Okay. So tell me this. What is the difference between Best Buy's controversial Total Tech membership, okay, which has already been used to block off access to PlayStation 5s and Xboxes? What is the difference? between their total tech membership and say, for example, a members only store in the first place, like Costco. Costco. Um, Tell me, because now GPUs are behind the total tech paywall. And, and there's been a whole lot of shenanigans around this because some people didn't have it already and they went to get it so they could buy a GPU, but they were all gone. And then it's like $200 a year for a total tech membership. And they're like, oh. uh, where's my GPU at, yo? I think one of the big differences is that the Costco membership, I believe, is like 40 bucks a year and you get money back and stuff. Mm, only with the credit card, I think. Or is that with the, no, with the executive membership, but mm. that one's cost more. That one's way more. Right. So what's the difference? What, why are people so upset? 
I'm playing devil's advocate to be very clear. Uh, I don't actually think it's all that different. Um, there, there's there's a difference because you can still shop at some of the store. Um, you just can't buy the the like highly desired items. Um, but the Total Tech membership comes with other stuff as well. I don't remember everything in it. Uh, extended warranty, and I, can't I think you like else, automatically yeah. get whatever it's called, I don't remember, but the Best Buy exclusive extended warranty thing. Yeah. I think you automatically get some amount of Geek Squad coverage and some other stuff, I don't remember. <laughs> chat's, good. chat's going right now. They're going right now, it's great. The difference is price. It's $200 for a chance. Yeah, yeah okay. the fact you that guys, it's a chance you guys are is right. Look, just, just let me play devil's advocate, okay? You. <laughs> yeah, the, the price is super brutal. The The fact that it's a chance is super brutal. Yeah, um, the fact that Costco's membership gives you access to everything in the entire store at a deal instead of just the opportunity to buy something at MSRP. It's not even a deal. Yeah. It's basically a, a, a reseller program that you enroll in disguised as a consumer program is sort of my take on it. Now, now something I don't know. I'm not American. I don't shop at maybe. American Best Buy, so I have no idea. I've never actually looked into buying this for myself. But can you buy more than one GPU if you have a membership? No, if there's anyone who's got a membership, let me know. Or, or do they use the membership as a way of validating that you are just one person? to make it difficult to justify buying a new membership for every time you buy a GPU, uh, like eating into your scalper margins. Tell the, me that. The fact that it's paying for a chance, I find actually rather hilarious. Um, <laughs> I, I do, I, I honestly think the inclusion of the other benefits under the Total Tech program yeah. is mostly so that it doesn't just look like you're paying to enter a lottery. Uh, yes, um, but as a reseller, you would certainly benefit from extended warranties. Oh, for sure, why not? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, it sure is interesting. Blame it know. on Dev says there's no limit. Zerfel says you can as long as it's a different brand. And Ooh. Medavlevan says I have no idea what buying a GPU feels like in any capacity. Oh, oh, that's sad. To be frank, it's not that great. They're very expensive. <laughs> Even when they weren't like this, they were still pretty expensive. Have you started your uh, Steam Deck exclusive? I haven't. I'm not going to do that until after I do the review okay. because I want the switch to the Steam Deck to be on final software. And it'll, I mean, final is a very funny word in this case. But That's fair enough, though. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to have the customer experience release software using exclusively the Steam Deck for a yeah. month. Yeah. 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 That's my goal. Sure. Because I was going to say, like, honestly, at certain prices, like, I, I have heard people that didn't know you were going to do that mention, like, huh a reasonable upgrade path might be buying a Steam Deck as my new computer. I know, right? Which is just crazy. Um, but Kale Thus yeah. in Floatplane Chat says you can buy different SKUs, but not more than one of each. So a friend managed to get the entire Founders Edition series other than a 60 Ti um, with the tech, tech whatever it's called, uh, to total tech membership in the drop the other day. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that and for if us. You're, if you're a kid or a teenager or whatever, and you really can't find a card you don't want to try to support scalpers you buy this thing and then your opportunity doesn't really come up like that's got to burn so much oh that sucks that's 200 bucks is hey at least you've got lot. an extended warranty uh, hey! the stuff that you didn't buy thanks del oh wait sorry <laughs> <laughs> i yeah that's that's brutal because like what i remember back in the like what was it ps4 um i don't even remember what they called the xbox of that generation but whatever um, xbox one xbox one yeah the ps4 and xbox one launch yep. we had a conversation topic talking about how like 300 dollars was the like monthly extra spend for a household price point target thing yeah like just talking about how why is it that you know your your entry level consumer electronics, but still premium. So you know, like, why is it that you know an iPod, uh, you know, the base model iPod is three hundred bucks, and a game console is like three hundred to four hundred bucks, yeah. and like like all this stuff is around that price. And we were kind of talking about how that's that threshold between I can't like I I I can spend this money without thinking about it at all, and I have to save up for multiple months. It's like riding it, that it hits a lot of people within that that yeah. column yeah um so the fact that it's two hundred dollars 
And that's such a significant portion of that amount of money. Yes, it's been a decent amount of time since then. Inflation has happened. That number has probably gone up a little bit. But still, 200 bucks is like, that's a very considerable amount of money. Oh, it's a ton of money. For a chance. It's a ton of like, money. what the heck? That's brutal. Man, have you ever tried to look at the YouTube chat? It goes so fast. I can't even... Anyway. Yeah, it um, doesn't like buffer send like Twitch does. Sir Flufficus uh, had a really good point here. The Steam Deck CAD files are a big deal. Valve released CAD files for Super the Steam Deck cool. housing. You know, it's funny. I asked them for them prior to launch because we were considering working on a case before we found out that Valve was going to make their own case and just include it with us. So we're like, oh, okay, well, that's pointless. Um, but we were going to do a case that would like fit inside the backpack for the Steam Deck. Oh, okay. I think the Steam Deck's going to be just such a game changer. They're going to sell so freaking many of these things. Anyway. Um, if they can make enough. Yeah, well, that's a thing. So I, I actually asked them, I was like, hey, can we can we get the file? Can we either get an early one, an earlier one, so that we can start working on this? Or can you send us the file so we can 3D print it? And they just like were like, no. And, and, then, then, he, <laughs> and then they never mentioned it again. And then suddenly they just dropped the CAD files, which is amazing. So that means that basically anyone, at least I think can use those to develop accessories for the Steam Deck or their own personal... Little say, 3D printed case. Say, for example, you know, a full-size SSD adapter dude yeah. out of the jig. Because yeah, yeah. there's so much space. Like, it's thick on the sides, but it's actually quite skinny in the middle. So if you made a new back piece, right? You wouldn't even really notice That had, much. like, a, a little... You, you gotta know, dodge the, the carve buttons. out for it. You gotta dodge the buttons, but... That'd be yeah. super awesome! Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, Cosmos says, Everyone I talk to thinks it's overhyped. It won't be a game changer. It's just a handheld gaming device. I guess by that logic, the Nintendo Switch wasn't a game changer. It was just a handheld gaming device, right? Yeah, yeah who cares? Yeah, how many Nintendo Switches did they move? Uh, Not Zelda, that I think many. it was like uh, dozens. Was it dozens, yeah, I think? Yeah, it's at least a few dozen. Uh, yeah, uh, total total Switch sales. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, hold on. I, I got to run some numbers here. Uh, calculator. Uh, here, let me just do it. How many dozens is this? Mm hmm. Divided by 12. Okay, so it was uh, 7,583,333 dozens. That's a few dozens. That's a few dozens. <laughs> That's a few dozen switches. And not only that, but look at this sales curve. It's barely even flattening. <laughs> Handheld gaming is a thing, ladies and That's gentlemen. Kind of epic. And what's so cool about the Steam Deck is the library. A, it's enormous, and B, it's cheap. Yeah. It's so cheap. How much does it cost to buy a game on the Switch compared to the Steam Deck? In a lot of cases, double, triple even. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Even the same same games. And and here's the coolest thing. Moore's law might be dead, but there are other laws. And computers are definitely still getting faster. So at the rate that Nintendo iterates, which is slow, conceivably, we could see new Steam Decks year over year with spec improvements that, yeah, right now, okay, you're right. Battery life, bit of a bit of a fly in the ointment, unless you're playing pretty casual games. Over time, I expect that to improve. I am freaking excited because it's going to be an extremely big deal. There. I've said it once again, and I'll probably yeah. say it again. Another person in chat brought up a really good point, too, is that you can buy a Steam Deck, and then you automatically, if, if you're a PC gamer, you automatically have a library of games for the new device. Now. You don't have to buy new games. That's right. Already there. That's right. Very cool. Freaking amazing. I don't necessarily think the Steam Deck is going to have the uh, amount of sales that the Switch had. Um no. Because the Switch is more compatible with normies. Yes. Um, I don't think they're going to move 91 million, but they will sure as heck move a million. And like the, the fact that people are strongly considering using them as computer replacers is like, that should, that should tell you a lot. Just, we'll see how well that works. It's so cool. Like there's so many things that are great about it, right? Because uh, like controller compatibility. Oh, yeah. Literally anything with a bluetooth connection i'm sure valve's going to be working on whereas nintendo's like use our expensive controller that's not even that great no no nintendo no bam 
so someone in chat was like, it doesn't have arms that like that like weird switch game. That like weird boxing switch game with the like spring arms. <laughs> okay. Yeah, true. Or uh, a cardboard fishing rod. Probably <laughs> probably shouldn't pick it up then. To be clear, I'm not down on the switch. <laughs> yeah, I got, no, I think he was just joking. I got a switch. Love the switch. Yeah, the switch yeah. is great. It's certainly lighter and smaller. And it runs Nintendo games, which is absolutely a benefit. Big I benefit. I picked up uh, Ring Fit Adventure for the kids. It's cool. My daughters were couch potatoes, like my son is, he's super, I don't know where he got it from. He's like super athletic. But my daughters are like, you know, playing with their little horsies. Like they don't like to really, they don't really run. <laughs> I guess would be my way of putting it. They are super into Ring Fit Adventure. Ring Fit's cool. And I'll, I'll go and I'll check on them. You know, hey, how you doing? I, I, I don't count uh, Ring Fit Adventure as screen time because it actually does. Have you tried it? I own it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah you go. Oh yeah, like you go pretty good. It's kind of, yeah. it's pretty awesome. So that's one and of the make deals. You, yeah, yeah, is that Ring Fit Adventure doesn't count as screen time. So if you ask to play video games, if it's Ring Fit Adventure, it's basically a hundred percent chance, unless it's like bedtime, that I'm going to say yes. So they're super into it, and uh, I'll go check on them. And it's like, oh yeah, they're sweating. My daughters never sweat. It'll make you burn. Dude. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's good. It's amazing. Yeah. The first time I tried it, I put it on like the maximum difficulty because it's like, oh whatever. And by the time I was done, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I might need to relax this down next time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a cool game. I find the old Wii Sports to be more fun. Oh, yeah. Wii Sports was a blast. But I put so many hours in Wii Sports. It doesn't burn you anywhere near as much as Ring Fit does. Oh, not even close. Boxing got you pretty good. Yeah. Um, especially if you're like my son who would play the boxing games like this. And always beat me. It was so frustrating. Because <laughs> the motion controls were so janky oh, back so then bad. that there was like... Almost no actual strategy. It was yeah. just luck whether you would hit or not. Yeah. So annoying. Conrad says Ring Fit is still like eighty dollars. Otherwise, I would get it. But that's that's the Nintendo way. Yeah. I mean, Breath of the Wild is still like sixty Canadian dollars or something stupid like that. Yeah. The Ring Ring Fit was really really difficult to get a long time ago as well. I don't know if it still is or not. But in other big news, Nvidia and ARM ain't getting together. The deal is officially canceled after pretty much everyone objected to it. Uh, SoftBank will instead take ARM public in an IPO, which was their original plan to begin with. They are leaning towards listing on the NASDAQ stock exchange. However, they remain embroiled in a legal fight with the head of their Chinese joint venture, Ellen Wu, after the board tried to remove him. ARM warned they had been stopped from auditing the accounts last month, with month which their CFO, Inder Singh, admitted they will need to fix in China to proceed with their plans. <laughs> Rut row. Ooh. That's a little awkward. Yeah. Man, if I was, if I was like really, tr you know what I want to know is what would prevent us from taking Linus Media Group public? Like, I think people would buy shares in Linus Media Group. Yeah, but you don't want them to. Right. Aside from that, though. Okay. Okay. I, aside from me, what would prevent? I, I actually know so little about the process because my understanding is yeah, I know nothing about the it. main benefits of being a public company are a when you do your initial sale of stock, you get a cash infusion because people just give you money and then you have that to spend on expanding your business, and then beyond that, my understanding is somehow your market cap affects how much you can borrow. Like it's some kind of indicator that financial okay. institutions will look at to determine your your level of credit sure. worthiness. Yeah. Um, so beyond that, what's the point? I don't really get it. Why would I go public? I don't know. People say as long as you own the majority, it's all good. Could you do it for only, say, 30% of the company so we could invest, but you retain control? But why would you do that, Commander Crazy? I mean, you already subscribed to Floatplane, so clearly you just like throwing money at me anyhow. Yeah, like if, uh, if By the you, way, thank you. If you um, own the company, you can just be like, nope, no dividends ever. Yeah, I mean, we could. That's not very nice. No. That's not could. like a nice thing to do. Initial capital infusion, ability to use stock as financial compensation for employees, etc. Um, I mean, I think you can do that anyways. LTT coin to the moon. We were so like gonna do a coin, and then the whole thing just got like extremely. We were like, 
this is terrible. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> we, I even said on WAN show, there's some, there's, there's some ancient clips of me being like, LTT coin is coming. You better believe it. And we had even come up with some pretty cool things that we wanted to do with it. Yeah. But what we realized is that no cryptocurrency was ever about there being something actually useful to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. You can buy and sell drugs. Um, sorry, what? Cryptocurrencies. Oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. But yeah. that's not why anyone ever created one. Like, there's no drug coin. There's probably drug coin, but people just use, like, regular <laughs> cryptocurrencies for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know this one. You were then beholden to share loaders. Share lo share loaders. <laughs> Shareholders. <laughs> Freudian slip. You either own 50% plus one and make a bunch of money or stay private until you realize you've passed the point of inflection where your ability to make more money stops growing. Yeah, okay. I mean, if you blew up in 10 years, early stockholders would make a profit. Yeah, that's that's true. I just don't know if I would see... Um, I just don't, don't know if we'd see that kind of explosive growth. We've always been slow and steady, slow and steady, slow and steady wins the race. It's just the only reason that I've been thinking about it more lately is because we can't relocate. I can't, I can't ask the team to do that. We're realistically not going to move to... Camloops or some somewhere affordable. Our, our window for that is kind of gone. And we've gotten to a point in lower mainland real estate where we could lease, but I don't like having an uncertain future. Yeah. So I would want to own whatever headquarters. We own the headquarters we're in now. That was the... Oh man, by, by how much? By a lot. The largest investment that I had ever made in yeah. my life. Yeah. When we bought this headquarters, but... <laughs> Boy, has it ever paid off. Yeah. I mean, we would have already paid a landlord what this place has cost us, and they would have gained like 3x their initial investment in equity because that's how much real estate is going up here. So the, the problem with that is that as our company grows and our revenues grow, the real estate cost is growing alongside us, so we can't afford anything big enough that we could actually grow into. <laughs> and so... That was something that made me think maybe this is the time that we do need to actually raise cash. Because I don't need it to like make more pillows or print more shirts or even buy lab equipment. That's going to be a big investment, but it's it's manageable. It's something that we can build up over time. And as long as it's something you can build up over time and it's one-time purchases, well, that's manageable. You can plan for that, right? But like it would be a, a a tens of millions of dollars investment to get a new place to move into. And I just don't have that kind of capital. And that's something that I think would significantly change our ability to grow over the years. The problem is just that you create this, uh, DJ Spark says, I'd love to invest. I would hope for dividends, but I'd be happy with just carrying the stock until retirement. But the problem is that unless we unless we actually carry on, unless we find a way to make the business sustainable, you know, beyond my prime years, I'm past them. I'm going to be 36, I guess. Like, I ain't getting younger at this point. And so we'd have to find a way to make LMG sustainable in the very long term for me to be able, in good conscience, to take your money in exchange for shares in this company. So, yeah. Uh, Jaden said, or relocate LMG, so he probably wasn't listening to earlier. That I, I tried to convince Linus and Avon a long time ago on a, on a few different locations, but that, that ship has definitely sailed. There's way too many routes here. Like yep. the amount of people that have um, bought or have leases on places, the amount of people that we've had relocate here, it's not exactly easy to just pick up the amount of people and families that are connected to the people that live here. That would be spouses of the people that live here needing to get a new job at another yeah. location. Like that would be extremely destructive at this point. And Linus Media Group is not a building. Yeah. It's people. Yeah. We, we, we wouldn't be us if we tried to be us somewhere else. It just doesn't work that way. And uh, yeah, we, we just, that's not, yeah, that's not how we, that's not how we roll. Um, uh, Gremlin Injector says, uh, to add to this, a huge problem recently has been private equity basically owning all the good companies. There's a fraction as many publicly traded companies as there were 20 years ago. Yeah, that's another thing that I, I read like one article about it and I was like, what is this? SPACs. Have you heard of SPACs? S-P-A-C's? Uh, apparently that's a way that people are are 
raising money without going through a lot of the due diligence that's required for a formal IPO. Special purpose acquisition company? Yeah. So that's uh, very, very interesting. Because it would be easier. But it also is apparently rife with abuse. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Uh, Black Cat Wright says, my worry if you did take it public is that your investors could sue you for any major bad things happening to the company. Yeah, that's something. Being beholden to shareholders is like a scary, that's like a nightmare that's for me. Lame. It's an actual nightmare. Yep. Um, and Sir Fluffica says, maybe a better option would be some kind of merch subscription where you pay monthly for exclusive merch. So the reason we haven't done a subscription for merch already is that I don't believe in people just buying stuff sight unseen without thought. Uh, I want purchases on LTTstore.com to be driven by clearly superior product quality and design and not just a desire to support us because the reality of it is producing and shipping these products is extremely resource intensive, carbon intensive, however you want to, however you want to say it. I don't want people just buying it for no reason. I want us to earn it. Um, yeah. I want us to earn your business. So uh, a merch subscription doesn't sit well with me and we will probably never do one. The only way we would do one is if I, if I had some reason that you guys needed refills of something on a recurring basis. Uh, say, for example, we had a consumable item uh, that we would ship to you every month or something along those lines. I could see us doing that, but something like shirts, no, you guys just, hey, if you're engaged with the content and you're engaged with the brand and you love the quality of the product, you come on the site, you see a design you like, you buy it. We're not Puyo, just going to send you stuff that you don't want. A random t-shirt SKU is significantly different than a than a merch subscription. Those are, those yeah. are wildly different things. One of those is I'm... I like all the t-shirts and I would like one cheaper, please. And the other one is randomly receiving things on a, on a period basis that you probably don't need or necessarily even want. Because exactly. a lot of subscription things, people will forget about them and or be too lazy to cancel them. And then stuff's just showing up at your door that you don't want anymore or whatever else is going on. And, um, oh shoot, what, what, were, you, what were you talking about again? Oh yeah, mystery shirt. And mystery shirt is actually a way for us to avoid ever having to destroy anything. Man, it just, it boils my blood when I see whether it's like food being dumped into the dumpster or shirts that have been spray painted uh, so that they can be disposed Isn't of. Is it like Louis Vuitton or something that lights their stuff on fire? I don't know, but I hate I it. I, I hate it every time I see that stuff. So mystery shirt is a way for us to get rid of like the last seven triple XLs and the last two smalls of this design. So you, don't, you don't necessarily want to have- seven mediums of this one. You don't necessarily want to have a, a, a store entry for a product that only has one size still in stock. Exactly. And there's only like four of them. Like you don't really want to do that. So it's better to just pull it down and put it up differently. Yeah. Uh, what's going on here? Oh my goodness. Float plane chat has just exploded talking about this. I was trying to kind of look at the chat, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, contamination at Keoxia could cause computer Ooh. component costs to climb. Analysts are expecting a five to 10% price increase for flash storage after WD lost six and a half exabytes of NAND due to contaminated materials at its production facilities. It was detected in late January by joint venture partner Keoxia, who claims that the contamination only affects its Bix 3D NAND flash memory and has assured that their 2D NAND products are unaffected. It remains unclear when production of the contaminated plants will resume or if products on the market will need to be recalled. Oof. Brutal. This happens to NAND like all the time. Every once in a while, it yeah. It yeah. feels that way. Very consistent. Uh, WD and Keoxia primarily supply NAND and EMMC storage and the partnership makes up, uh, makes up about 30% of the NAND flash market. They have not been specific about the cause, but if the source of the contamination was a chemical supplier, then other manufacturers who share the supplier could be affected too. Sadly, this news came right as Keoxia celebrated the 35th anniversary of their invention of NAND flash storage, a game-changing technology. Bit of a lousy birthday. Yeah, Oof. really. Uh, discussion question here from, um, I don't know if he's off probation yet, but AS, is how little 2D NAND is used these days? Why do you think Keoxia mentioned it in their press release? I would suspect they're still using 2D NAND for a lot of lower cost products. I mean, if I was a if I was an enterprise customer of Keoxia and I heard their NAND got screwed up, I might assume all of it. Yeah, that's And if fair. I purchased 2D NAND, I would like to know that yep. the 2D NAND is okay. 
In other news, Tap to Pay update might turn all Ugh. iPhones into mobile payment terminals. This is actually crazy. What? There, there was uh, some interesting feedback that I saw online about how Apple is really not that great at getting businesses to adopt their new software technologies. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but I mean, not needing to work with Square would be pretty interesting. It's a lot of it's going to depend on their financial stuff. Apple is a huge fan of taking as much money as they possibly can in every scenario. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but this could be a massive game changer to Square who really I don't think has had I could be very uneducated on this, but I don't think they've had a huge amount of competition. Uh, Square's been the one kind of every time we've time. looked into it. Yeah. 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 Like there's been a few different options, but Square's been the king for sure. And anytime Apple or Google or Microsoft or whatever enters the ring, um, that gets questioned, right? So we'll see how this goes. It's interesting. It's also a new thing in the space that I think people would trust, you know? So. Apparently, it's only an API for other people to use. Companies like Square can now include that functionality in their app, says Snow Skeleton. Mm, interesting. Very interesting. So it'll offer the same security and privacy of Apple Pay, i.e. Apple doesn't know or collect data on what is being purchased or who the buyer is, and tap to pay will be made available to iOS developers and other payment platforms, starting with apps that use Stripe, with other platforms to follow later this year. We will have to see... If uh, it poses a threat to products like Square's $1,200 plus full cash register systems. That's more what I was talking about. I, I, the fact that they can integrate it is like neat or whatever. But yeah, it's the fact that it's just your phone versus needing to buy like, because at the very least, you have to have that thing that plugs into your phone mm -hmm. from Square. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Apple sure locked Square. Yeah, they, they sort of did. Yeah. Apple, I mean, they, they sort of are the origin of the term Sherlocking, so yep. that shouldn't surprise anyone. <laughs> yep. That's kind of how Apple rolls. <laughs> uh, all right, we should do a few more merch messages here. Yes. Hi, Linus and Luke. Do you have any suggestions for gaming-focused universities? For yeah. example, with gaming design, production, et cetera, types of majors. You're not going to find a ton of great advice about post-secondary education from either from of us. two dropouts. <laughs> um, but maybe the rest of the chat could pipe up yeah. and let you know if they have any thoughts. Uh, Dan asks, hey, Linus and Luke, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on everything needing to be app-based? It was very frustrating to have to use the home app to set up Chromecast when it was possible by PC in the past. Huh? PC is the best. Um, the, I mean, it's just the way. It's just the way. I don't make the rules anymore. Everything is app-based. And I mean, frankly, it's way better than it used to be. Do you remember setting up stuff like, remember that old Parrot drone, the AR drone? Yeah. And like what a nightmare it was oh, to go was, through the pairing process back in the day. Rough. Yeah. These days, man, I paired a pair of Sony uh, earphones today where I literally opened up the app and it was like, I, I just had them in my ears. I didn't press a pairing button or anything. And it was like, hold your phone near the earphones. And I was like, what, like this? And I look back at my phone and it's like, we found them. Like, <laughs> well, that's really nice. Basically like magic. Um, Andrew, are you still making the 3090 tie? <laughs> like the, the tie. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and are you considering making a case or travel pouch of some kind for the screwdriver? Okay. Okay, hold on a second. So first of all, the tie, yeah, we definitely want to do a GPU tie. We think it's funny. Second, hear me out. Get a whole backpack? Holster. Oh, no way. Are you actually doing one? I want to. <laughs> Leather, like primo. Oh, man. Primo holster <laughs> for the screwdriver. Would you wear your screwdriver in a holster? I'm talking with the snap, the snap button. If I, like... If you were a tech? If I was a tech, exactly. I was going to say, if I worked on a job site where I used my screwdriver all the time, I might be the type of person that would do that as like a flare thing. I'm talking like the old cell phone holsters, okay? <laughs> Clip on the belt, flap style holster for the LTT Wait, screwdriver. So you do it so the point's down, yeah? I would think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Ah? Yeah. Ah? Yeah. 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 All right. Oh, man. <laughs> 
I want to do it. Jumping the shark. No, no, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's going to be amazing. And yes, it will just hold a single screwdriver. Um, other than that, you should have like a like almost like a bandolier on it that has like extra bit storage. I'd be into that. Like a little. I don't know how to describe it properly, but I think I no. Know. I, yeah. I understand what you mean. Yeah. We could have a magnet behind it so they don't come out by accident or something like that. Yeah, yeah, we could totally do something like that. Uh, Bum says, I'm an electrician. I would wear it work. We wouldn't make it specific to our screwdriver. We could definitely do some work to make it, um, uh, not universally, but more broadly it, compatible. You know, work yep. best with, with yes. yours. But... Yes. Best with ours. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be freaking awesome. Man, I, I'm so excited for it. Uh, P.S. Uh, charger slash audio cable pass-through hole on the backpack would be convenient. There is one. Is LCD Store going to do a backpack ever? Yes, absolutely. Uh, That's it, by the way. Yeah, this is it. There's one right here. Boop. So if you want to put something in this <clears throat> mesh pocket here, which is zippered, there you go. Then you can run it to somewhere else if you need to. Um, ugh. By the way, this is a new revision. Oh. Still a few more changes, so that pushes it back another probably couple of months. What uh, changed? Uh, well, we came up with an idea for how to make it, you know how people ask to have it be luggage compatible? So you could slide it over the luggage. So we came up with an idea for how to do that. Um, we created a strap Ooh. that would go on the back that would uh, clip onto these uh, loops. These are like metal. They're super, super nice. Um, we don't, we don't like it though. These kind of actually, I kind of stopped noticing them. It probably would have been fine, but you feel them on your back. Yeah, we wanted a, we wanted a better way to do this, and um, yeah, I could feel them on my back sometimes. So what we've decided to do is we're actually going to take some inspiration from here. We go, these guys. So you see these little like, little like clip-on okay, spots yeah, that we've like, got here. Yeah, not actually, but moly style. Yeah. And we're going to do uh, probably three loops here, here, and here. And it'll just kind of come down here. So then you can use them for anything. You could just hang stuff off the side yeah. of your bag. Or you could put your your back piece that will act as that sleeve. Uh, you could clip it into that. It'll probably be Velcro. I think it'll be Velcro. Uh, or hook and loop fastener. I don't know if it'll be brand name Velcro or something comparable, but um, not Velcro brand. There's lots of good hook and loop fasteners out there uh so anyway it'll probably be like that and then it will for storage i think we're going to aim to have it be foldable in a, in quarters and then slippable into the enlarged passport pocket down here cool so the idea is that when you are not traveling you will have that thing in here right okay and when you sense. are traveling you will have your passport in here yeah um so that's that's where we're at on that uh we added these on the front so more little loop things. And this was from when I was doing a video with Colin and I needed to have a walkie. Oh, you wanted somewhere to put it. And okay. I wanted somewhere to put it. And so we added them on both sides. Uh, we still have the little, uh, these are now removable. So you can completely remove the chest strap and just, you can chuck it in your passport pocket or chuck it somewhere else if you want. Uh, what else did we change? Uh, we changed the pocket layout in the front. I'm not sure if I'm 100% happy with it, but it's definitely better than before. So it has a long boy pocket for the screwdriver now. So it's fully screwdriver compatible. It has just a little pocket down here now. It doesn't go across the whole way anymore. Oh, sorry, you guys can't see. It doesn't go all the way across anymore. Uh, this, put my mask in there. There's your pen pocket, just a, a mesh pocket here. I got it. I got it. This is a more of a between us thing, but I got a nostalgia trip seeing what was in that pocket. Oh, the Steel Series little like headphone case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's my little bag of tricks. Yeah. <laughs> got good stuff in it. Uh, we expanded this pocket on the side because I like to use it for a mouse and my cable. So we, we wanted to make it bul bulgy enough that you can actually put a mouse in there. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what we did there. We finally have the proper microfiber on the inside. This broke, it's just an early sample. But we've got the microfiber on the inside, so you can feel what that's going to be like. Uh, not on that one. Uh, the screen pockets. Yep, that one. Oh, nice. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And the pocket layout in the main pouch. Sorry, this is turning into a backpack, a backpack showcase. Uh, hold on one sec. So this is cool. Uh, all three sleeves are now on the back side. So there's your laptop, your tablet, and then something else. The intention was a game console, 
like a Steam Deck. And then we got the Steam Deck and it's like this thick. And we're like, no, we, we, we cannot build a sleeve for that. So the intention now is that your Steam Deck, you can actually see the shape of the bottom pocket. Your Steam Deck is going to be um, uh, joysticks toward that way. And then you're going to kind of have a bit of a recess here for the handholds. And it kind of sits in the bottom really nicely. And then we're going to change. This is using the self fabric, which is like the main fabric right now, but we're going to put a screen fabric down at the bottom of that pocket. Cool, cool. It makes the cleanability not as good, but that's a trade-off we're willing to take so that you could put a screen device down in the bottom if you want to. Um, there's only two spots to hold chargers. They're up here, and it's like one big, one small. Uh, but for me, I only need one charger because everything in my life is Type-C now anyway. So I use it for a charger and a battery bank. And then, oh, here's the thing. So here's the strap thing for the back. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I just had it sitting in there. Um, this color's not quite right, by the way. I like it, it's super vivid, but we're gonna go with a slightly less um, eye-searing orange for the inside. It's uh, <laughs> more, uh, more in line with our regular like Pantone orange. Right. Uh, and finally, you've got the main pocket of holding, which just has the one kind of zipper pocket right here and then the sleeve for the 40 ounce water bottle. Oh, I have a Steam Deck in here. Oh, that's convenient. Okay, hold on. I'm going to show you guys how the Steam Deck goes in then. There's a question saying, uh, would this would this fit a weekend getaway worth of underwear? Uh, hold on. Absolutely. Worth of underwear with all the electronics. I think absolutely. I think if you wanted to fit everything in there and you had pants every day, it might be a slight issue. But it's about 40 it. liters. Um, I think. 40 liters? I think so. Don't quote me on that. Uh, so here, uh, there, you can, oh man, the lights, you can't really see it. Okay, but whatever, Luke, you describe it. You describe what? How it kind of fits in there. Like, look at it, I mean. Oh, I can just feel it. Yeah. I mean, uh, the width-wise, it's it's almost exactly the width of this. Yeah, it fits really snugly, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so I still have concerns about the joysticks, but we're... Uh, we've got we've got a few ideas for how we can tweak it to make that work. Is, is there, there's probably going to be cases for. There are. It comes with one. Yeah. So if it comes with its skew. own case, if you drop the case in there, I'm sure it'll be perfect. Absolutely. Or you could drop the case in the main like bag of holding yeah. pocket. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to show you is these. So the last revision didn't have the proper zipper pulls, and this one does. Oh, cool. So they're little carabiners. You can click them into each other, and you yeah. can click them into each other just That's to sweet. help a little bit with theft resistance. Um, as well as if you're just I, like I ride my motorbike uh, with my backpack a lot of the time, and so open. I'll have like a badminton racket sticking out of it, and if it accidentally comes open, that's sort of a problem. Well, we see it. I've gone to a lot of conventions in my day, um, yep. and something you'll spot very often is someone's backpack hanging open, um, and I don't know if they just forgot to zip it up or, or someone whatever, opened it, or but someone might have opened it, or it might have jiggled itself open, and being able to just click it close like that creates a, a barrier of difficulty. Of course, if you just like abandon your bag somewhere, it's not going to save you. Yeah. But, yeah. We should do an air tag pocket. Shoot. I didn't think of that. Oh, I didn't show the sunglass pocket. By the way, that's our material for the sunglass pocket. Super nice. You could probably just have a little... You should touch it. In the... Is this the same as the... I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the same nice. as the last one. Now, something that Bridget and I went back and forth on a lot, and I, I will listen to your feedback, but I think my decision is final is the color of the hardware. Oh. We both love this matte black that we have right now. Matte black everything. Mm. Except, look at the base of this one. See how it's wearing? Yes. So, the debate was, do we go with something that looks flippin' amazing out of the box and looks beat up in six months? Or do we go with something that doesn't look as good out of the box but will look exactly the same in six months. I think I would argue exactly the same. Yep. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to change the hardware to like a gunmetal, not yeah, black, but a dark gray. All yeah. of these have that same sign of wear. Yep. Yeah. And it's, there's just, there's just nothing you can, there's nothing you can I do about that. I gray would still look really good. It'll still look really sharp. Just maybe not, you know. But LTC uh, 19801, have it anodized. It doesn't matter what you treat it with. It will also, they're not going to be made of aluminum, I don't think. I don't think you'd want something like this made of aluminum. I don't know how durable that would be. Depends on the aluminum. They might be aluminum. I don't know. The point is, no matter what you coat it with, it's going to wear. 
it's it's it's, it's something you're touching, yeah. right? So I just I just don't think it's feasible. Um Green O Photon, what do you think of the rumors Valve will release a new VR headset next year with a Steam Deck like APU combined with an XR2 using the same 4K by 4K uh, micro OLED display as the Apple's as Apple's rumored headset? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> That's what I'll say. For me, I tend to treat no Yeah, I tend to treat things that aren't out yet as things that don't exist. I will say there was rumors that Nintendo was going to do a VR headset because they made a powerful handheld console. There were also rumors that Nintendo was going to make a second generation Switch that was actually more powerful and then they didn't. Yep. Joke's on you. Yep. I've been watching you guys for years. Hey, thanks, Bradley. Uh, Linus, what's your favorite Beat Saber song? Oh, that's a good question. You know what? I'm going to go with, um... oh, man. Was it Song Saver or Score Saver? Song, Score, Score Saver. Drumroll oh. Dancing was huge for me. Oh, yeah, that one's so catchy. Big recommend. Uh, there's definitely ones I like better now. I just don't find that one as engaging to play these days. Linus is really good. I would um, try Caramel Dancing. <laughs> uh, what's it called? Is it called Turn It Up or Turn The Music Up? There's just a really, uh, a really fun uh, night core turn up i don't know i uh i think all you need to hear is nightcore to know that's probably going to be pretty tough i don't know it's it's good though uh looking for new maps to play i don't know maybe i'll stream maybe i'll stream this weekend uh brandon says i know you guys are making specialized caps for the screwdriver for your fellow youtubers any chance you would sell this to the public so we can color code our screwdrivers based on different bit sets in case we may buy multiple oh well i didn't think of that that's an interesting idea that's a really cool idea I mean, obviously, I like the idea of anyone buying more than one of the screwdriver, but I had not considered this particular reason for doing it. Huh. Um, interesting. God, you could have your your screwdriver holster on one side, and then yeah. your, like, different <laughs> your different loadouts on the other side. Hmm. Okay, it's not too late, so at least I don't think it's too late. It might be too late. Uh, I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, I will. You talk a lot about quality, but I see nothing on location. These items are on the website were made or any sort of stance on ethical treatment of people making the items. You should be more transparent. Um, you're right. So I will. You know what? I'll talk to Nick about what we can what we can do about that. I will say that we do have our own internal standards for the uh, factory conditions for everything that we are selling on the store. Um, we are also moving almost all of our stuff now is either recyclable or recycled material in the packaging. Um, these aren't things that we talk about a ton, but they're things that we just care about. So we have third-party inspectors that go to our factories now, both for QC as well as for factory conditions. Um, one of the things that we are have not reached a scale yet where we can really conceivably do it is going upstream to our suppliers' suppliers, and that's something that we'd like to continue to work towards, but that's kind of where we're at on it today. Peter says, do you think the development of SteamOS for the Steam Deck will make DIY Steam Machines for couch gaming a viable option? Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it does by default. Absolutely. Yeah. Joshua Carroll says, why do OLED TVs show signs of burn-in within months, whereas OLED phones don't show any kind of image retention after a couple of years of use? Okay, so for one thing, they actually use fundamentally different OLED technologies. Fun fact, you ever notice that for phone screens, Samsung is the absolute king when it comes to OLEDs, and where have they been on OLEDs for TVs for the last five years? Nowhere? Right. Yeah. And then, do you remember when LG had all those issues with their OLEDs in the Pixel... Crap, what was it? Was it the three generation or two generation? I think it was three. I can't, I can't remember, but the point is that they are actually more different than you would probably imagine. Um, so other than to say that they are very different, I don't know the specifics. Uh, also, why does my iMac show signs of image retention? Ah, so that is a different kind of image retention. That's not burn in that has to, that can actually be fixed by like refreshing them in some, in some way. I can't remember. You, there's articles about it. Um, we've never really done a video about that. Either, I don't think. Zachary says, can you share any details about the follow-up between you and Dell or other integrators and secret shopper? There just wasn't really anything. 
So we're just going to hit them again when we do another Secret Shopper, and they'll probably be still be terrible. <laughs> Aaron M., do you believe the APU in the Steam Deck would issue a response from Intel to make something similar? Well, no, because it's a custom SKU for Valve, so uh, unless someone's going to book, you know, 2 million units or whatever with Intel, I don't think they're going to get out of bed, assuming driver support gets better, or for NVIDIA and Intel to make a handheld like the Razer Edge years ago. I think that really it's going to come down to partners. Intel always likes doing things through partners, so they'll try and work with a Dell to make an Alienware competitor or whatever the case may be. And Intel is so uh, deep into XE graphics that I wouldn't see them working with NVIDIA because nobody likes working with NVIDIA. I've never seen uh, a company push partners as hard as Intel has. Mm-hmm. Intel has sponsored me at shows to not cover them. Yeah, they do do that, though. Yeah. Uh, Brett, thanks for making another tote. Uh, still use my cloth one from a while ago. Any plans for another attempt at whole room water cooling? Oh, yeah. You better believe it. My new house is plumbed for whole house water cooling. <laughs> so crazy. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Brian M., I have an S9 that's getting long in the tooth. Would you recommend upgrading to one of the S22 variants? Actually, S22 is looking pretty good from my hands-on time with it. Um, I haven't daily driven one. It's a whole thing. Samsung sent a loaner device, which from my perspective is um, like if I only have it for a week, I'm going to do my short circuit video with it. And then if I have to send it back, like I'm not going to bother setting it up getting all my accounts logged in, getting everything dialed in exactly the way I like it so that, like, because realistically, it takes me a matter of days to get everything actually all set up and migrated over. And then what? I'm going to send it back to them? It's like, okay, forget it. So I'll just wait until I can get a Keeper device, whether from dbrand or buy one or something, and then I'll, I'll see if I... And before I do that, I'll see if I even care about reviewing it. Um, I did like them from my initial impressions, but I, I haven't... I haven't daily driven them because I'm just I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. I have I have stuff to do. Uh Nick Hill says getting a 40 ounce to tide me over till the 64 ounce drops. When yeah. and red design when? I don't think we have any red coming. White and red, he said. Uh white and red. Oh, we should totally like do an O Canada color. water yeah, bottle. That'd be sweet. Okay. Uh I will make it so. Oh you Canada guys should launch it on Canada Day. Water bottle. Red slash white. We could probably even hit Canada Day. What do you think? Um, the Canada Day launch. Uh, would you non-Canadians out there buy a Canada-themed water bottle? Just because? Man. Okay, here's a question. Am I allowed to use the maple leaf, or is it, like, trademarked by the government? I think you can. I don't know. I'm pretty sure you can. Okay. I, can you? Like, I, I know there's... What uh... if I wasn't Canadian? And I, like put maple leaves on stuff am i allowed to do i think you can put flags on things okay like i I know a lot of uh, american companies put american flags on things um i don't i'm not 100 percent certain how the canadian version works Um, people are like yeah oh oh they're oh no never mind they're like yeah we'll do it all right heck yeah heck yeah float plane yeah i'm pretty sure you can put the canadian flag on it yeah okay i don't know just it just occurred to me i was like are you allowed to do that that's kind of uh and then uh default also, oh, people oh, found it. People found the like government page. Commercial on it. use. Oh, interesting. Use of the national flag of Canada and the stylized 11 point maple leaf for commercial use. No person shall adopt in connection with a business as a trademark or otherwise any mark consisting of or nearly resembling so as likely to be mistaken for the arms crest or flag adopted and used at any time by Canada. Okay. You have to request to be allowed to use it. I have a feeling this is one of those things that doesn't like actually get enforced though. Um, well, all right then. Hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, Nikhil also asks, how can I use my GPU to live upscale USB or PCIe capture card output like the FrameMeister and upscaling TVs do? Is it possible? My understanding is that could be possible, but I'm not aware of any software that does it. Don't flip that over. Sure. I think it looks better. Sure. Yeah. Photographer. Nice. Ethan, Bloatplane Chat right. agreed pre-show that you should do an LTT version of Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog with Luke as Captain Hammer, Riley as Moist, Sarah Butt as Penny, and James doing the Bad Horse Chorus. I don't even know what Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog is. Oh, it's good. It's all. It's pretty old. Um, it's been a long time. Um, 
all I know is that I would be honored to be uh, Captain Hammer. Okay. Brian L., with your issues with the Floatplane app on the Play Store and Apple's App Store, why not explore other options like F-Droid? Um, is F-Droid relevant? I mean, being in the official store is where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's gotten better. <laughs> For some reason, both app stores went completely haywire at almost the exact same time. And then since then, both app stores have been completely fine. So who knows? I never got a response back on that flag that they sent, by the way. I don't okay. know if I really talked about that on the show too much. They just removed it silently again, as they often seem to do. Okay, cool. Like, cool. All right. Uh, Fella Days TV says, if I plan on upgrading my current GPU, 30 series, to 40 series, do you think the PCIe 3.0 in my 10900K will be a problem going forward? Well, you can wait and see. That's the good news. You don't actually have to upgrade now. Hmm. Um, and no, I probably wouldn't go 11th gen to get PCIe Gen 4. I would probably flip my 10th gen and I would jump to 12th or... Uh, upcoming Zen 4 processors from AMD because that tends to be the better better bang for the buck. Uh, or it tends to not cost that much more, like changing out one more component. Uh, E&D, how has your experience been with the Fold 3? I got mine at the end of December, and I already got a stuck pixel. Ooh, interesting. I do not have any stuck pixels or anything like that. I overall find myself using the front display a lot more than I expected, but I have not switched off of it which I guess is as strong an endorsement as I can give because I can use any phone I want. I have literally a bin of phones like 20 feet from here. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I, I like it. I wouldn't pay for it. I wouldn't and didn't. Um, yeah. I wouldn't pay two grand for it. That's, that's tough. That's kind of crazy. Uh, there's still software things that are not perfect, but I do like it. Um, it's a pain in the butt to do app dev for. Mm. And I think everyone agrees mm -hmm. like not this is not mm. a just us thing mm -hmm. so any app problems that you have i'm very mm. not surprised yeah uh do you think you'll switch to the s22 ultra i was thinking of uh using it for a bit it kind of reminds me of my old note i hate the whole punch display i need it to go away in a fire but the bezels are otherwise so slim maybe i'll just set it to have just blank pixels at the top i don't know i'll see how i feel about it chase says i want to buy a steam deck but i'm worried about the low rgb coverage i was wondering if it could be caused by the etched glass screen would i be better off getting the cheaper one for deeper color i suspect it'll be the same it's just valve said that our results were within their expectations so that's that's how the screen looks but the thing you got to understand is that like 65 or whatever it works out to i think it was around there uh percent coverage of srgb is not the end of the world you would never use it for any kind of professional work certainly but just like sitting and gaming it's fine it's fine. we got by on worse uh, Hunter L says, celebrating my raise with some LTTstore.com, would you consider doing a video on different accessibility features and devices? For example, the Humanware Braille Note, a Android tablet with a refreshing Braille display. Had that come across my desk at work. Wow. Did, did we ever actually do uh, a video on the Microsoft like accessibility controller or whatever it's called? Yeah. We did. Um, that thing's freaking sweet. I mean, this sounds super cool. The thing, though, is that we're just not the market for it. So it's kind of tough. Um, it's a tough thing for us to cover. I don't think we have anyone here that speaks Braille. We could we could hire someone who does. Um, they wouldn't have experience in making videos, so we could, like, collaborate with them on it. Um, and it's, like, it's super cool, but I, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like the people for whom these products are made know about it. They have their own media outlets that cover this stuff. Yeah. Like, I'm, sometimes it's kind of like a stay in our lane thing. Yeah. Uh, do you expect Valve, asks James, or third parties to make DIY upgrade kits for the Steam Deck? It would be awesome if I could get an OLED screen in like six months. I doubt it. But I would love it. I would love it so much. Man, that'd be awesome. I'd put an OLED on it like that. <laughs> Might I use this subject to mention Alana Pierce's Accessibility Awards and collab with others next month, says Ducky Lewitznumph over on uh, Twitch chat. Awesome. Cool. Jake's talking about the i4M50 in the chat. Whatever, Jake. Whatever, Jake. Ty can or go home. 
What a fanboy. Such a BMW fanboy. <laughs> it does actually it. look really, really good, though. I'm sure it does. But the, the Taycan's the big flex. Does now it that have ha turn signals? Now that Hassan has one, it's clearly okay. Because you can be as left wing as you want, and you can go full Taycan. <laughs> he not only went Taycan, car. well, like Canadian. I think it was like two hundred plus US for the oh, okay, for the yeah, trim yeah. that he got. Oh man, people are saying he's gonna like do it up too. Hilarious. Nice. All right. Capitalism car. Jake says, "I don't see you in a Taycan, nerd." That's cause it. I didn't order one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Have you seen his house, dog? No. No, you, yours. What? Mine? Yeah. Oh, why? You can stunt with a house more than you can stunt with a car, in my opinion. I mean, I think it's a cooler stunt as well. Look, all I'll say is, you got your you got your like sunglasses and chains. Yeah. You just like shoes. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you got your cars and watches. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Then you got your like house. Yeah. Bitch, I own a warehouse. <laughs> okay. Where's where's yacht? Is yacht like just the little tip? Oh yacht somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Anyway, the point is, thanks for watching <laughs> the land show. We'll see you again next week. Same bad time, same bad channel, ladies and gentlemen. Bye. <laughs> Did you even bleep it? Nope. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Chad caught up. <laughs> Jet's no longer the top, it's